Acme acknowledges the traditional owners, the Wiradjuri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, on whose land we meet tonight. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from all nations of this land. So, welcome to AI and Art, exploring the connections between creativity and technology. I'm Elizabeth Flux, the art editor of The Age. I'll be chairing the discussion today. So, it feels like AI is something we're hearing about increasingly more, like exponentially more. There's not going to be a lot of audience participation, only two. This is one of them. Um, and at the end, there's the opportunity to ask questions. That's the other one. But who here has heard about AI in the last week or two weeks, whether that's in news or in conversation? Just a show of hands. All right, so you're in the right place. That's good. Um, so of, of those people, who's heard about it in a positive light? Who's heard of it in a negative light? And who's heard of it in a neutral light? All right, so that's a, a cross-section, interesting. So tonight we're gonna get stuck into the truth of things, hopefully clear up some misconceptions and paint a more clear picture. So what it means to, what AI means to the art world, um, not just now, but going forward. But so to do so, let me introduce our panel. Memo Atkin is an artist creating speculative simulations and data dramatizations, exploring intricacies of human machine entanglements, perception and states of consciousness, the tensions between ecology, technology, science and spirituality using AI to reflect on the human condition. Rebecca Giblin is co-author of Choke Point Capitalism, director of the Intellectual Property Research Institute of Australia, and a professor at Melbourne Law School, where she works on questions, of, questions at the intersection of law and culture, particularly creators rights and access to knowledge and culture. Rita Arrigo is a renowned digital strategist with a reputation for her ability to lead digital transformation project in the public and private sector, and a passion for AI and emerging technology. So if you haven't seen it yet, Memo Atkin Distributed Consciousness is located in Gallery 1. I'm pointing that way because that's the door. I don't know the actual direction. <laughs> um, it's inside the story of the Moving Image Exhibition and generously supported by Naomi Milgram AC and the Naomi Milgram Foundation. So to kick off our discussion, Memo is going to talk us through this work. So over to you. Uh, thank you very much and thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to... Uh, try to quickly whiz through some of the themes behind the work. There are um, many layers uh, to the work, and so I'll just summarize them briefly, and we may or may not come back to them in, in more detail. Um, so on one hand, I made the work in 2021. That's when it kind of started, really. And it was a response to the explosions of NFTs in 2021, um, if you might remember, and the so-called Web3 movement. Uh, centered around decentralization and distributed computation and all the ideologies that came along with Web3 um, and blockchains, etc. And But it's also a response, um, and perhaps more so, to the climate crisis, uh, the general ecological devastation, uh, mass extinctions, etc., that our civilization and our way of life is responsible for and our inability to mobilize uh, to take action. And the work employs cephalopods and cephalopod cognition and their distributed uh, nervous system and their distributed intelligence as a means of reflecting upon the increasingly pervasive synthetic alien intelligences that we're building um, that we call AI. And especially those or the perspectives to do with scraping the internet and our collective consciousness uh, that is, exists on the internet. But also trying to draw attention to the distributed nature of intelligence and knowledge in general, in that all intelligence and knowledge is distributed, uh, collaborative and collective, and the boundaries between individuals and species and living and non-living systems are more permeable and dynamic than we might think. So the work draws parallels between the distributed cognition of cephalopods with the distributed computation performed by uh, smart contract-based blockchains. And ultimately the work is, um, as we face the challenges faced by the climate crisis and general ecological devastation, the work invites us to meditate on our relationship with all the living and non-living beings that we share our planet with and we are invited towards a decentering of human exceptionalism and invited to let go of the dangerous dichotomy of man versus nature 
and I use gendered language deliberately here, that has been embedded in our culture for so many years, and instead to embrace the interconnectedness of all living, non-living, human and non-human beings that we share the planet with. So those are some of the themes that I'm sure will come up uh, and more in our chat now. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So the work as it exists now couldn't exist without AI. So I guess I want to ask about AI. Technology has always shifted art. So is AI any different in the way that, say, photography has changed things in the way that anything has changed in the past? Whoever would like to go, you can all go if you like. Not I'll, at have the same a, time. I'll have a quick go. Um, I do think that technology does dramatically shift art and we can see that through the kind of things that happened with the internet. I think that really changed the way we could find art, the way we could experience art and people starting to use it in, in very different ways. But I think AI has a really significant um, difference to that and we're seeing a lot of artists kind of indulge in the capabilities of AI, particularly around um, the ability for generative AI. So that, and that, that's, and you'll see that in your work, like the significant use of generative AI in the imagery as well as in the language that's being used. Um, I would say that we've always made art from the tools of the time um, and we see it really uh, obviously when we, with the advent of digital and we saw much, much more sampling and mashing up and so on. Uh, but one really interesting difference, I think, with AI and particularly generative AI compared to earlier technologies is that there is, like, these technologies are not going to become sentient, right? And they're not going to take half of all jobs, right? Um, and so the, the, the hype men that are out there, and again, I use the gendered language advisedly, uh, that, are, that are telling us to worry about those threats, they're doing so for a reason. They want us to look over there. Um, but I think that there are things that we should actually be thinking about which are over here and is going to drastically change the um, conditions of many kinds of labour markets, including creative labour markets. And I think one of the things that we really need to be focusing on, um, as Molly Crabapple has pointed out, is that if technologies like image generators seriously disrupt the market for um, creative workers to, like illustrators to actually work and to make a living, but they're built on they're only possible because of training data that is from the work of, of pre-existing human creators, then that is a difference. Um, and somebody said to me recently, I just found it so incredibly striking, oh, but you don't understand, you know, artists are just like the buggy whip manufacturers. We don't need them anymore. <laughs> and the fact that somebody said that out loud, it really just stopped me dead in my tracks and realised I'm in such a bubble that, that that couldn't possibly have occurred to me. Um, and that, that one of the differences is that like, there is this, this risk. If, if there is a widespread perception that, that the kinds of outputs that can be generated by this are sufficient and that we don't need to, that we devalue artists more than we already have, and I think that's something we really need to be thinking carefully about as well. Do we want to live uh, in a world that doesn't have artists and doesn't have fresh art? Because I'm just wondering what sort of world that person is imagining, like if you don't need, like what sort of art do they want to see out there, or is, is it a world without art at all? I think it's a world that's very tightly controlled. Right, because if the machine is generating the thing rather than a human, that's something that they can understand and reduce to a binary of zeros and ones. But as soon as you add humans into the equation, it takes it into a, a broader power, perhaps. You, you might even assume that's a very uneducated opinion as well, potentially. But, I mean, you depend, you, it depends on what kind of education you're talking about. So this person was very highly educated in tech, for example, right? but you might say not as inculcated or in the art world. But they're not a stupid person, um, but perhaps just a narrower focus. Mm. I, I also want to add the word AI is very complicated and amorphous, but even more amorphous than perhaps AI is the word art. Mm. And one of the really fascinating things about this discussion is people use the word art in com very different um, meanings. Like, and I, I'm not making any value judgments here, but for example, someone who models a, th a tree for a video game, their title is artist, that they're, they're a 3D artist. Someone who does, um, I don't know, a, a backdrop for a film, like a, a set, 
they're called an artist. Someone who makes an illustration for a book is, is an artist. A subway worker is a sandwich artist. <laughs> okay, uh, that I was not aware of. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, musicians are called artists, actors are artists, and okay, we're all artists, but definitely the impact is going to be different. So I, I generally use, I don't say computers are going to make artists obsolete because that's just too broad, but creative laborers, people who work, put labor in, in the, what we call the creative sectors, which is also a problematic term, I think, because doctors can be creative, lawyers could be creative, um, unfortunately, or fortunately. So creativity has nothing to do with art, really. They're, you can be an artist without being creative, and you can be very successful, just apply the formula that works. Um, but we call them creative sectors. So people who work in those fields, yes, there is going to be a lot of automation where maybe one person using software is going to be able to be more produce more output than 10 people before. Going back to your original question, one thing that's so fascinating, because there's a lot of anti-AI art hate out there on the internet, it mirrors the Luddite movement so much. Um, in the 80, early 1800s, when the Jacquard loom was invented, what it did is it allowed unskilled laborers to replace and do the work more efficiently of the skilled artisans. And the introduction of this technology did not benefit the artisans, it benefited the factory owners. And so they effectively exploited the labor of the artisans and then they managed to just dump them and switch to unskilled laborers. And now, uh, with generative AI, you can produce images without requiring the skill of drawing or painting. Um, on one hand, this is democratization, which we can chat about separately, but the, so I do think there's a lot of value in this and it will allow many people to tell stories that they weren't, would not have otherwise been able to tell. Um, but for example, Stability, um, the company behind Stable Diffusion, off the back of this, huge pool of skilled artisans are now worth, well, they were worth 10 billion or something. Well, what are those people worth? Nothing, they're, they're, they're potentially losing their jobs. So this is really the heart of the problem, is like where does the benefits of this in value, who does it benefit? Yeah, and I think that that's really important um, to, to make those connections and to notice that the people who are funding these technologies and trying to shape them are not people who are setting out to make the world better. Uh, they're venture capitalists who are setting out to make ever more money for themselves and for their investors. And that's exactly um, what they're going to be doing. They're not going to like, strip away half of all jobs, but they are going to be making work worse. So there's more surveillance um, that is a reduction of kind of creative control and discretion of humans, more um, uh, reducing it so that, that you need less skill to do it. Because if you start with a, 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 an artificially uh, generated image and then you don't actually have to hire a skilled illustrator to make it you just have to hire somebody who's got more basic skills to come in and do the edits to it they're not able to ask for as much like as good uh, pay and as good condition but there's definitely organizations and corporations and um, businesses that are looking to responsible AI and and I think you know and a good example of that might be someone like Getty Images who's about to launch a um, generative AI service that uses responsibly copyright um, copyright images that have been paid for to then then you can then pay for these AI generated images but I would then say look downstream at the conditions in which photographers licensing images to Getty Images work and the, the, the choke points that these other big corporations do. So even if they do license the copyrights, and we saw this with, uh, with Adobe, with the new version of um, uh, the new generative AI version with Firefly, they said well, we've licensed all of the training data. And technically they did, right? But that was because they got all of the contributors to their stock images to sign over their rights in the small print. They didn't even realize what they were doing and then used all of this. And when those those photographers and illustrators complained about it, they've said, oh, we're gonna maybe try and find a way that you get paid for it later, but you did technically agree to this. So there's ethically sourced and is ethically sourced, I suppose would be my response to that. So how do we protect creators? Like how do we, like, because the problem often seems to be people behind the scenes making things worse. So how do we protect people downstream? 
So there is some work going on around um, there's the coalition of content privatisation authority called C2PA2 that was began in 2021 and it was to develop an op open standard for indicating the origin of digital images and whether they were authentic or AI generated. Um, and they've been it all came came through when we all saw the Pope in the puffer jacket. <laughs> so that kind of started a lot of this discussion around it. And, you know, it was Mid Journey that did that. So there's a lot of companies that are now kind of trying to say, okay, if we, we've agreed to sign all AI art with a cryptographic watermark, Microsoft's one of them and there's a range of other companies. So there is work ahead around, you know, trying to find these ways of being able to ensure that there's... Um, there's an indication of AI art that's going on with what you're producing. Uh, so, yeah, but I know that from an Australian perspective, you know, we still have a very different copyright law to the rest of the world. So you can probably attest to that as well. It's, um, it's, it's a much tighter from what I understand. Yeah, it varies in some ways, but um, I think that there are like things outside of copyright, like labeling, I think is a really interesting one. And I think what we're gonna see um, is the importance of this in the context of music in particular. Music's been a bit behind the text generators and the uh, image generators, partly because there's a real uncanny valley issue where people can really tell when there's something just a tiny bit off in the music and very often the, the synthetic music is just a little bit too strange. Uh, but it is coming along now in leaps and bounds and there are certain genres that lend themselves better to synthetic music than others and, and particularly in that, the ambient space. And we think about what the downstream implications of this is going to be. We see how Spotify is really trying to reduce its um, its costs and like it, it spends almost 70% of its uh, revenue on licensing fees at the moment. It's already been caught out um, getting um, sort of uh, prioritizing artists that in, enters into special deals with fake artists who provide like ambient music and so it prioritizes that music in its playlists and algorithmically delivers that into audience ears instead of um, music by people like Brian Eno who then get shifted off those playlists. We can see that like there's very easy a potential for them to be creating their own AI division, creating their own AI generated music and then putting that into listener ears now that we have outsourced to Spotify in so many cases the power to decide what we listen to. And I think here we need to have like solutions like labeling. There's nothing that's going to stop them to, from doing that in copyright. There's nothing that's going to stop them from doing that in contract law. But it might be that consumers want to know that what they're listening to is generated by machines. Um, and maybe that will change their mind about whether that is actually what they want to put into their ears. Or maybe they'll be like, oh, well, it's $2 a month less. That'll, that'll be fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, at a concert that Beck did a little while ago, he played an AI generated Beck song um, and apparently it was terrible. So I've got a little bit of time hopefully um, for that. But you talked a bit about democratization before. So I want to get a bit into that because it does sound like doors are closing in some ways, but are other doors opening? Yeah, that's um, actually a really good follow up from, from Spotify because, or, or music rather, because today, I mean, always, you know, musicians, are struggling like a handful make it make it um, and then the vast majority don't um, so th this issue ex already exists in music but I often like using um, the analogy when we talk about what's happening around AI and current AI tools and generative AI tools um, I like the analogy of the drum machine uh, because the drum machine, uh, when or even like electronic synthesizers in general, when they were introduced, many didn't even consider them valid music instruments. Um, you know, it's not a violin, it's not a piano, etc. And then people making music with these electronic uh, devices wasn't even considered decent, proper music. But what it did is it allowed a whole new generation of people who didn't have access to an orchestra to make music. I mean, hip hop exists because of turntables, because of uh, the drum machine. Um, and so, and today, what we call laptop musicians, um, they exist because of this new technology. Now, drummers didn't go obsolete, drumming still exists. But it is true, and I know this from actually a family friend, um, that a lot of drummers did lose their jobs because all of a sudden at weddings or at 
various stews, instead of hiring a three-piece, a four-piece, a five-piece band, you could hire a smaller, cheaper band with a, with a drum machine. So there is always this shift. But so when I talk about the democratization, I am referring to the fact that people who don't have access to uh, a, a, an orchestra could make music. And from a very personal point of view, I can say, as a kid, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, and you know, growing up in Turkey, I didn't have any access to anything that could help me be a filmmaker. I didn't have access to people, didn't have access to equipment, etc. Luckily, I had access to a computer, so I learned how to program, and that was my entry into making moving images that somehow tell the stories that I want to tell. So I'm s very, very excited about um, you know the potential of kids in various parts of the world who don't have access to a lot of equipment. But if they have a computer with an internet connection, um, they might be able to tell stories that they would not otherwise be able to tell. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I'm quite excited about the, the potential of these technologies as well. Not only because it's going to mean like at that, that really entry level, we're going to be able to see more people be able to make stuff, but we're going to be able to see um, professional creators take it much further and in different directions. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's a much more nuanced story about what what the impacts are going to be for creative workers. Because it might be that it makes certain kinds of, of, of work more accessible and then results in increased commissions for the kinds of people that can make that. Right? And so I think that there's like huge potential, particularly for sort of you know more personalized things, uh, more local stories to be told, uh, potentially. Like making a, a film a, a based in a local community is still really expensive, even in 2023. But in 2025, is that going to be a lot easier? I think potentially for sure. Um, and so I think as well as the sort of there there is this a. Uh, there is this darker side and there's the potential that we need to be watching out for about the, the dangers of this. Getting a little bit excited about the potential too and thinking about the ways in which we can help provide the conditions for that to flourish is something I'm excited about. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of creatives are seeing it as a creative renaissance in a lot of ways because it means that a lot of the um, the – the things that they didn't have in the past are now available to so many more people and that that visual language can actually be a lot more easily interpreted by many more people than it being something that, you know, you need five academic degrees to understand or something like that. So it's that democratising of a visual language kind of uh, that, that, is, that is seen as very positive. And, and I think we underestimate the potential of it. Go on. I just wanted to add one thing about um, what you said at the very end there. Um, I'm also an educator. I'm a professor at UCSD in the visual arts department, and I've been teaching an AI class to art students, um, graduate, undergrad and graduate, uh, for, for a few years. And two, three years ago, a prerequisite for my class was you had to know how to program. I could, uh, I would only, I could only do my class with students who already knew how Python and knew a little bit of technical things because t even two years ago you had to program to be able to do anything visual um, with AI and then we had DALI and um, Mid Journey and also something called Google um, the Collab Notebooks became very popular and added UI etc. Anyways, things changed in the last year and so I was able to give a new class to art students and, mu and music, music students and it's completely no technical prerequisites because we, we have the tools to do it. And as a result, the projects that they're doing are so much more diverse because the people who are able to come into my classroom and to work with AI are just, they come from completely different backgrounds to the much more limited set that I had before when I said, okay, you have to know how to program to be able to mm. do these tools. So um, that's, I think that's, that's very exciting. Yeah, it's definitely the user interface for these generative tools has really opened it up to so many more people, like the non-coder, which there are so many of us out there. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a really exciting renaissance in that way. What are some of the ways that you've seen AI used in creatively in art? I mean, to, we've talked about the terms, but what are some of the ways you've seen it used? I mean, I, I went, went to New York earlier in the year for the first time and I saw Refik An one of the works by Refik Anadol where he uses different ways to generate 
moving images. Like he pulls them from databases. Sometimes he uses it from EEGs and it's just amazing, huge. If you've had the chance to see them, they're amazing. They're huge, large scale, mesmerizing ones that are constantly evolving. And he's been working in AI for quite a long time. So that's one way he's been able to tie in like something really human, like the way your brain works, like your EEGs and make it visual in a way that people would never otherwise be able to see. Mm. So that's- I've, I've seen, uh, I work at do do some work with the science gallery. So I've seen things like um, the ability to use, being able to understand your emotion and then being reflected in an art piece so that they can it can identify whether you're happy, sad, disgusted, um, you know, these kind of elements, which I saw being done with the smell of blood. And that was just amazing to be able to bring that interaction in mm. by understanding the human emotion. Um, I've also seen um, lots of robotics being used in, in art, which is really popular. But it's 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 hard sometimes. It's you know it's hard to define whether that stuff's interesting or not. But there's a famous artist that uses Spot, the robot, the Boston Dynamics robot, to actually paint and generate art as well. So Ooh. it's kind of wild. People have some really interesting reactions to those robot dogs. Some people really cannot handle them, and some people love them because they're like dogs. I mean. I know I said two, but show of hands, who's seen the robot dogs in action? And <laughs> who liked them? Okay. <laughs> I, I who who thought they were going to eat your face? <laughs> I, I like was I'm just so creeped out by them. Uh, one project I just remembered. Um, it's, it's I don't know. It's not really an artwork, but it, it's by Mario Klingerman, who's been working with AI for for quite some time as well. And it's something I think he made it in 2016. It, it's co co not even a recent piece, and he was, did it when he was a resident, artist in residence at Google Arts and Culture, um, which is actually, there's a lot of problematic aspects there, but I'll bypass that for now. Um, but what he did was he did this tool, and I think it still exists online, where you select two artworks from the database, Google Arts and Culture, and they've been um, archiving artworks, you know, all kinds. And so the project is called X Degrees of Separation. You pick two artworks, any artworks you like, one could be a sculpture, could be um, a, a piece of pottery, it could be a painting, and it plots a path of visual similarity from one to the other. And what that means is, it's effective, it looks like a morph, so let's say you pick a, um, a Roman marble statue and you also pick um, a pot. And it does a kind of morph from one to the other, but it's not an actual morph, it just picks other artworks from its database that would be steps in this morph. Mm. And it's a really mind-blowing way of exploring the, this vast database of human creativity uh, across you know, millennia and seeing the similarities across continents. And yeah, it's really, really fascinating. Amazing. Well, we talked a little bit earlier about the ethics of where AI sources images from. So I'd like to get a little bit deeper into that because I mean, there's the controversy earlier in the year when the app Lenza was um, very popular and then a lot of artists started to notice that their styles were being used to generate pictures through this. So again, I'm coming back to my question about how do we protect creators, but also like how, how can artists be part of ethical AI usage in future as well? Mm. Yeah, I think, um when it comes to when it comes to copyright, uh, first of all, copyright only protects expression; it doesn't protect idea. And we generally have accepted over the years that an artist's style is on the idea side of that spectrum. Um, but that doesn't mean that that in response to you know the the fact that now and uh, so we were playing around with this this afternoon um, in my copyright class in the masters, um, and one of the prompts that we used was to like, first of all, okay, create an image of a law school and then create an image of a law school in the style of Wes Anderson, but then create an image of a law school in the style of Kathy Wilcox, right? And I was really curious to see when somebody suggested that, how well like an Australian cartoonist would be represented in the, the training database, whether we'd get something that was like at all recognizable. And this was on Mid Journey and we did, like it was so distinct. Like if I'd seen any of these images, I would have been like, that's a Kathy Wilcox. Um, and so there are questions about whether we should find a way of, of protecting style. Um, and I think uh, the answer is possibly, but probably copyright is not the right way because copyright rights are you know, usually fully alienable and they get extracted very easily via contracts. 
Um, and so just merely having the copyright is not very useful if you don't also have the power to hold on to that right. And we're seeing this play out in real time at the moment with voice actors um, working on computer games. They walk into the studio, they sit down, they pick up the microphone and they have to say, I'm Rebecca Giblin, I hereby assign all of my rights over this recording for you to use my voice, including in training a voice model. Right? And so then they are effectively, because they don't have the power to resist agreeing to that transfer because they um, want to get this work over the 5,000 other people who are in line to be a voice actor on a video game. Um, uh, they're not able to hold on to it and, and so then they have to compete with a synthetic version of their own voice, right? So they are undercutting themselves. Next time they come in, it's just like, well, why should we pay you that much money? Because we can get a pretty good um, simulacrum of your voice already with this. And so we want to be maybe thinking about, well, these are personal rights and, and voice models as well. Um, the, the ability of now with just a very small amount of training data for people to be able to say things in your voice, to put words in your voice, it's so intensely personal. And I think that that focuses attention on, uh, invites us to think about, well, what is due to us as humans, right? And are th is, the, is the, the personal nature of what's going on, does that invite us to think about what's different between humans and machines? And indeed, like just take it one tiny step further, what's different between humans and corporations? And do we, do we need it to be treated differently? And so I'd say we need to think really carefully about these questions, but I, I would also avoid rushing into any kind of, um, any kind of, a conclusion that copyright is the thing that will fix it. And I've heard some really, what I think is quite dangerous reasoning recently, and again, this was a, a conversation between Paris Marx and Molly Crabapple, where they sort of, by the end of the discussion about generative AI, they're just like, okay, well, copyright, well, we've been pretty skeptical about it, and it's really not great in a lot of ways, but maybe that's the best thing that we've got. And I, d I think that's dangerous to just settle for this thing that has done a really poor job of getting artists paid and has also achieved a lot of collateral damage in terms of the loss of, 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 of culture through um, rights that are often overbroad and extend anybody's interest in them. Um, and we should be thinking much more directly about what do we want to achieve and how do we go about doing that and finding ways that are not the things that the frameworks that we invented hundreds of years ago when the printing press was invented to actually achieve it. There's actually um, Australia's AI ethics principles that we're one of the first countries in the world to have one in 2019. They were all put together and they're around um, transparency, um, fairness, um, you know, um, accountability, um, a, a range of different and there's a lot of work being done. I, I, I personally work at the National AI Centre and there's a lot of work being done in helping people to understand how to translate those principles into practices in the way that you d deploy your AI in your organisation. And Lenze is actually a great example of one that didn't didn't do anything for um, the whole inclusion because I, I heard of a lot of people that using their avatars and in, the men would get these amazing pictures of astronauts and scientists and the women would get these naked fairies or like you know other kind of examples so it's it's really interesting how many AI products are out there at the moment that are not in line with these ethics principles but I think there will be this drive around responsible AI that people will see that as not just um something that they have to do but also something that their brand and their values um really really open up to because that way you're actually going to have an AI industry that people want to use as well. But we're actually also going to see the guardrails coming off and like a lot of the big products that are out there at the moment, the commercial products, they've been really careful um, to avoid. Like we already know that if you if you provide something without guardrails, humans will do terrible, terrible things. And like, for example, like with Microsoft's chatbot a couple of years ago, turn it into a Nazi in five minutes. Um, so if you do like in, in mid journey and there's a lot of prompts or I get, I was like, oh, I think that you might be violating the community guidelines. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Uh, but they're being really careful. But there are some um, products products coming out there like there's one that I was playing around with where it will undress any woman right so you take a, a clothes picture of a woman and using this neural net it will take her clothes off and show you what apparently she looks like underneath so again these are really personal things that you know, we, we haven't necessarily thought too much beyond the idea of um, the misnamed uh, revenge porn around what to do with pictures of us but the idea that fully closed pictures of us could be put to this kind of use is something we're going to be confronting more and more so it's the the drive to less ethical as people figure out how to take the guardrails off and these technologies yeah. escape into the wild but that's probably like more of that deep fake kind of scenario where 
you know, we do have a lot of challenges around deep fakes with voice, deep fakes with faces. Um, but I think already people are working on, you know, deep fake detectors and, and a lot of tho those. And there is a high barrier to create those kind of really good deep fakes. So it's it's not it's not something that, you know, you can just download a free product and do. So there's a there's, there is a barrier to a lot of that kind of stuff. There is now, but um, I'm pretty sure that like to, to create a very believable deep fake, yeah, right now you need a lot of skills. Um, but yeah, within a few years, I'm sure it, it will be off the shelf. But um, in response to what you were saying, Elon Musk famously found ChatGPT to be too woke. So he wants to build his own version that, that's, <laughs> that's not woke. Um, but, but going back to your question of how do we protect the creators, um, I don't have an answer, but I would like to make the question more difficult by adding some more complications. Um, because, I mean, already uh, you've discussed it all. I, I just wanted to add a few points, which is one of the maybe obvious potential solutions that's been proposed is this idea of consent for training data. Because right now, uh, the models are being trained on just stuff scraped from the internet without the original artist consent so like famously one of the most recent data sets is called lion it's what um stable diffusion is trained on for example and it's well initially it was five billion images trained um scraped from the internet and there was a huge outroar because for example it might contain lots of artwork by a famous um the canonical example is greg wachkowski a fantasy painter and then you can say okay give me a dragon doing this that the other in the cell of greg wachkowski and it gives you something that looks like, um, at least to an untrained eye, very much like Greg Rutkowski. So then the first step was, okay, you have the option as an artist to opt out of the data set. And this was obviously not enough because if you might, like I actually have hundreds of images in, in that data set. I personally am not, you know, it doesn't threaten me, so I, I'm not bothered about it, but the, argument was okay it shouldn't be opt out it should be opt in so only artists who agree to be in the data set should be in the data set and this might seem like a good idea but it really isn't because for two reasons you don't need to be in the data set to be able to be replicated you can have greg, Wood greg woodkowski removed from the data set but then i as an individual could take that model and give it one image of Greg, one image from Greg Wutkowski and say, um, create me an image in this style. So now the organization which made that data set, for example, Stability, is theoretically um, innocent because they didn't train on Greg's uh -huh. work. But I, as this random anonymous internet person, can still use that model to mimic Greg's work. So for me, the problem isn't what's going into the model, it's what's coming out. The other um, issue around all of this is, oh, I forget what I was gonna go with that. <laughs> anyway, so th this this is one of the, one of the big issues. Um, I, yeah, I, th I had another point, but I can't remember it now. But anyway, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. I just wanted to say that controlling what goes in isn't the problem, it's what comes out. And what comes out is not just a problem of AI, it also happens with without AI, like I could imitate someone else's work and th there's not necessarily any protection against that um, because copyright does only protect expression. If I imitate exactly the work, then okay, that's a, that's a case for copyright. But if I imitate a style or an idea, then that's not protected. Should it be protected? On one hand, knowledge progresses when we share all of this. So I like the idea of being able to train AI. Oh, that was my second point. If we start prohibiting um, and enforcing opt-in consent, then this might have a very bad consequence in that right now, um, there are a lot of open source movements in building AI. If we say, okay, we need opt-in consent and lots of artists opt out. This will allow big companies to hire artists and a handful of artists and just mass produce training data. 
and so then it will be even more um, isolated in the hands of these big companies who can afford to generate data to train on, and then all the open source or smaller initiatives will not be able to compete in producing models. Whereas right now, um, the open source alternatives are surprisingly, well not surprisingly, I should say, um, uh, inspiringly uh, on similar levels of quality. So I just wanted to add those complications in there. Just giving everyone a heads up that we're going to open up to questions in about five minutes. So with questions, please keep it to one line. Um, that will end with a question mark at the end. <laughs> and they'll come to you with a microphone. But that will be in about five minutes. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind if you've got anything, we should have time for a couple. Um, but I guess before we throw over to questions, these are big conversations that need to be had. Who should be in these conversations to continue developing the ethics, to continue putting in framework, to decide whether things should be opt-in or opt-out? Like what people need to be involved in those discussions? I think it's definitely a multi multidisciplinary sport. Um, and I think, you know, even in I, – I, I have a lot of focus in the business side of things. So, you know, they're already talking about having a responsible AI champion as part of an organisation that ensures that what, what's your, what you're doing is actually aligned to um, our ethics principles. Uh, but I think – artists, curators, gallerists, you know, if we're thinking about the, the creative sector, probably needs to be involved in some of these ethical discussions. A, a few um, a few little stories. So I have also academically been involved in AI. I, I have a PhD in the topic and I used to go to um, AI conferences. And in 2016, I remember going to um, an AI, like, biggest academic AI conference called NeurIPS, uh, Neural Information Processing Systems, in 2016. And it's, it's a technical conference, and there, it's huge, like tens, over 10,000 people, academics go. And there was one tiny little workshop in a small room about this big <laughs> that was around the ethics. And hardly anyone really went to that. Um, the following year, Kate Crawford, who is the, the founder of AI Now, which is one of the world's leading uh, kind of socially responsible AI organizations gave and a keynote. And Australian. And Australian, <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Uh, she's Australian, a really a wonderful person. She gave the opening keynote at, New at the same conference. Um, and a few years after, NeurIPS introduced a, a rule that any paper to be accepted to NeurIPS, and it's the most prestigious conference, needs to have um, an ethical considerations statement as part of the paper. And there was both a huge backlash against this from lots of AI researchers saying, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a scientist. I don't think about the ethical considerations of what I do. Um, why should I be thinking about why face detection should be, might be misused? Um, but there was also a huge welcoming. And um, I remember chatting with a psychologist friend of mine about this, and she was shocked that people don't think about the ethical considerations of the work that they do, because obviously in psychology in the 60s people didn't, but it's so ingrained now in um, psychology education that you do have to think about it. So what I'm trying to say is things are changing quite quickly, um, but I think it will take a generation for it to be fully um, embodied. I was once at a dinner with a senior Facebook AI researcher and I said, any team that, like a private dinner, and I said, any team that deploys a product that is going to be used by the masses needs to have, as part of the core team, uh, an ethicist, a sociologist, an anthropologist. In the same way that you would build a team saying, okay, we need two UX designers, we need a network engineer, we need a UI designer, you should put on that list as integral, we need an anthropologist who will study the consequences of this, that, the other. And this engineer got really angry and offended and said, what makes an ethicist have better ethics than me? Um, and that kind of shocked me and made me realize what a bubble I was living in. Um, but as long as, I, I also want to add, um, Google famously had said, we don't need regulation. Regulation can't take care of this. We need to self-regulate, so we will have an AI ethics board internally. And when those people run by uh, Tim Negebru 
did her job in highlighting the ethical um, dangers of the work that Google was doing, they fired her. So self-regulation also isn't necessarily an option. Government regulation, I can't even see how that could work. So I don't know what the answer is. Again, I'm just adding complications. Um, but, but I think it's definitely, it is going to be about the same way that we have our ESG goals, we have sustainability goals, we have diversity and inclusion goals, you know, all these kind of things. It will become part of that because otherwise, um, you know, algorithms and algorithmic decisions, they're going to be part of business, so they have to be treated like business. I agree with you and I find that really bleak when I look at how poorly all of those things are performing at the moment and how quickly we are running out of time to fix it. And so I think that that's something that we really need to be conscious of now. Like these technologies are going to become endemic. The legal consequences of this are going to take probably well over a decade for us to get even like start to get a first layer on our head around whether it should have been allowed in the first place. But by then it's the the horses out of the barn. Mm. And so I think we need to be... I don't know. There's been a lot of work. No, no, no. I, I do understand that, but also I'm looking and, – and, of course, there's a wide spectrum of actors in the field with different motivations, different business models, different funding and so on. But what I am seeing is that there's uh, so much capital being put into choke-pointing these markets as well to get the, these technologies into the hands of a small number of powerful corporations and to, 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 to extract ever more value for a short number, of, a small number of people – while ignoring the enormous environmental consequences of these technologies. And like we're actually running out of compute power and uh, uh, for, for some uses at the moment because so much of it is going to these, like as, as we're sort of seeing. You know, in the we don't even weeks. have a large language model in Australia. We don't have one. Yeah. No, <laughs> so no, 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 no. We're, we're, I think Syro is trying to buy, you know, everyone's trying to figure out how to get one. Um, but we, we don't actually have the hardware for one here. So there's only... And we also don't have the legal framework that would permit us to create one here. Like legally it would way, be way too risky. And I think that's what you were alluding to when you talked about well, Australia's that's why law we being... Don't have search engines. Exactly. Kind of so you should all know that we don't have any search <laughs> engines running out of Australia because... because of the legal issues. <clears throat> every single uh, making a search engine means copying everything on the internet and copying everything on the internet is a copyright infringement unless you've got an exception that applies which we don't um so yeah but i think <laughs> i think the government you know i think reg people are trying to get ahead of that and trying to because you know we've had so many challenges around you know the use of ai particularly with things like the robo debt um, issue that we have and and I really see businesses really wanting to get ahead of that and, and have this responsible AI strategy around what they're doing um, and I know it's hard to believe but <laughs> but um, there is a lot of work being happening in that space. I do know that they're trying but then I'm also acknowledging those broader considerations the fact that we lack the hardware and we lack the legal framework to even create the models here so therefore we're going to be by the time we get there these large models that are entrenched in other jurisdictions that have less consideration of that are going to be what what's on offer. So I guess I'm what I'm saying is like really urging us that we need to be paying really close attention to this now because you know how you know ten years after a new thing like ten years after smartphones came out we looked back and we're just like oh maybe we're not really that delighted with the consequences of everything that we've got from that and we think back and there were like a bunch of really obvious things that we might have done differently if we were thinking about it in the same way then as we are now. We're in that moment now. We're making those mistakes right now with generative AI. And in 10 years, we look back and we think back to this. And I was like, oh, I wish I'd said we should have done this, this and this. But we don't know what we don't know yet. I just know that we are making the mistakes right now. That's the happy period we're in. And that's an interesting point to see if anyone else wants to enter the conversation. We probably have time for one, maybe two questions. Is there? All right, there's one down here. Wait, wait for the microphone. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Memo, I'm really interested in how your art explores the connections with technology. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I started working with, I'll say, software in particular and writing code, um, really, as, as I mentioned, as a means, as the only means I had to making that was available to me. And initially it started out as a, as a tool, so the computer's a tool, and I'm using it as a tool. Uh, and it's a medium, let's say. And it's a medium that I really enjoy. It's a medium that is dynamic. It's a medium that can be responsive, uh, interactive. It's a medium that can scale to be very large and immersive. It's a medium that can be very small, 
um, and intimate. I've made apps as as artworks um, when the iPhone came out, for example. But I've increasingly become interested in this medium, not just as a medium, but also as a subject matter. So here, for example, I'm not just talking about AI. Um, well, I mean, obviously, you also are not talking about AI as just the tool, but the implications, the social, cultural, ethical, legal um, implications as a result of these technologies. So for me, there's always, it's very, very research driven. I love doing research and I do research both into how to use these technologies as a medium, but also the broader implications of these technologies like the legal, um, ethical, um, etc. And I started using AI. Well, I mean, AI, again, is a very, very broad term. Arguably, I've been using AI since the beginning. Uh, but I got into machine learning, let's say, uh, probably about 14, 15 years ago uh, as a way to build systems that could understand what was happening in the world around it. So I wanted to build responsive environments, interactive systems that could sense people. It could somehow try to understand what they were doing, where they were going, what they were saying. And this is the job of AI. And I gradually started more and more of that. In 2014, I realized um, I, this is getting big. This is going to be big. I really want to know this really well. So I started a PhD um, in AI. Uh, and little did I know it ended up, yeah, it did end up, end up being quite bigger than I thought, sooner than I thought. Um, I should also add, as a kind of side note, People always used to say um, the people who should worry f about AI for job jobs are like the, the laborers, the truck drivers, this, that, the other. Artists are safe. Um, and I was always thinking, no, 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 no. Artists, but not like um, conceptual artists, but I would say creative labor workers, they're going to be the first to be replaced. Well, replaced is a bad word, sorry. To be... Um, like automation to come into it because there's no absolute truth. You can get something wrong and be okay. It's not like a medical diagnosis where you say, oh, this person doesn't have cancer and it turns out they do. That's a mistake you can't afford to make. Um, but with what we call art, you know, creative labor, there's no absolute truth. And also you're not interacting with the physical world. Uh, robotics is complicated, but purely um, virtual is quite easy. Uh, so I was expecting what's happening now to happen, uh, like 10 years ago. I wasn't expecting it to be as soon as it is happening. I wasn't expecting it to happen in 2023. Uh, that was a bit of a digression. <laughs> uh, but does that answer your question, or I could go into more detail? Or? Yeah, can you go into more detail about your business idea? Yeah. So the work that I have here combines... Um, a lot of, well, it combines the, the two hype technologies of, of the time, actually, AI, uh, but also uh, blockchain and distributed computation. The idea of a blockchain is that instead of the way like Amazon would work is there's one with the Amazon servers and people connect to that server and Amazon owns that server and Amazon owns that data. The utopic vision of a smart contract based blockchain was that we distributed this and everybody owns it. It's, 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 it's actually a nice ideal. It doesn't necessarily play out that way. Um, but so that was he, that he exploded in 2020, NFTs, etc. So the work was a, a response to that. And I was using cephalopods who have a distributed nervous system. They, their central brain is, is actually tiny. They've distributed the computation across their body. So I'm using cephalopods as a way of, of reflect, reflecting on that. So again, the technology is the subject matter here, but it's also the medium because I'm use, I'm, I wrote custom software um, using AI. This was 2021, so before Mid Journey and all that. Uh, the images are generated with AI, uh, generative AI. The text is generated with AI. The text is encoded in the image as an invisible watermark. Uh, so I released the images as NFTs initially, and then a month later I announced that everybody who bought an image, you actually bought a verse from a manifesto that was written with AI. So it's actually a book that's distributed on the blockchain. Um, and 
Did a lot of people buy it? Yeah, so there were 256 images and it sold out instantly. It's worth also worth saying it was really fascinating. I released eight a day on Twitter. I announced it was all kind of pre scripted. So every day, eight critters were spawned, as I call them. They were spawned, set out into the world. And then I didn't do anything to create a community. Uh, usually in the NFT Web3 world, it's all about community, Discord. I didn't do any of that. But a community emerged and people were what it was, it was all auctions. People were watching and live narrating the auctions on Twitter. Like, oh my God, so-and-so just bid, you know, 957 says, oh no, this, blah, blah, blah. and it, I was just watching this in absolute fascination, how, um, you know, it's the pandemic, people really wanted community, and they were forming community around this project, the, mm. the NFT version of it. Um, yeah. I. So, because we were talking earlier, I actually asked you, are you pro NFT or anti NFT? And you kind of went both. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to explain that further? Yeah, I, th I think it's possible to be both on many topics. Um, with, with NFTs in particular, I was perhaps quite infamously um, against the blockchain Ethereum uh, for its ecological footprint in using this algorithm called proof of work, which I won't go into now. Too. But um, so I was very uh, anti that with NFTs. So I did this on another blockchain called Tezos, uh, which is thousands of times more um, environmentally uh, friendly because it uses a completely different algorithm. And Ethereum switched to this now as well. But uh, I was on the fence, or well, not even on the fence, I, you know, I enjoy being able to dig into the both extreme ends of uh, the discourse. On one hand, NFTs come from a very anarcho-capitalistic worldview, um, almost genocidal. Like if you read some of the early manifestos from the 90s of some of the people behind these technologies, they're genocidal. Uh, level of like, yeah, anyone who can't keep up with the technology deserves to die. And this includes, and then they list the kind of minorities that they think don't, shouldn't be around. Um, so it, it's that level in the early histories of these technologies. And arguably, you, you can see remnants of that in the, sp in the space. But on the other hand, there's a very utopic vision of um, decentralization, of equity, uh, like the complete opposite. And I wanted to explore and put myself in there to see what I would see. I I that's the same. Go on. I'm, I'm so sorry, but it's a very exciting bit of the conversation, but we have that's time, so we're gonna have to stop. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but okay. Thank you all for coming. Good point. <laughs> thank, you f <laughs> thank you to Memo, to Rebecca and to Rita, and thank you all for coming as well. And I'm sorry to cut it off at one of the most interesting bits, but we're actually already running over time, so. And thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you.